Welcome to Faith Baptist Church, where faith is our first name. Faith means we believe. We believe the Bible is the Word of God, and we believe that Jesus is the answer, and we sincerely believe that there's a place here for you. Faith. It's who we are, and it's who any one of us can be in Jesus. Hey, church, uh, thank you so much for joining us for our midweek service. We're glad that you've tuned in. Hey, we are just so excited about the way that the Lord has uh, blessed our missions conference so far. And tonight, um, we're fortunate enough to be able to hear from another missionary family, the Mortensen family. Now, the uh, the Mortensons have spent some some time in Honduras, and they're very soon heading back to the field. And so be praying for them, but we're going to hear an update video from them tonight. And then uh, Brother Mortensen, is gonna gonna bring God's word to us uh, a little bit later. I want to just remind you about Sunday. We've got two more missionaries uh, that are gonna be with us on Sunday, and so we're really looking forward to seeing what God's gonna do there. And then I want to give you one other reminder, and that is don't forget to pray. Pray for our missionaries. Pray for our missions conference as that continues, but then make sure that you check out our prayer list. Uh, It should be linked below in the comment section if you're watching on Facebook, and then you can also find it on the Faith Baptist family page. Now, if you don't have access to either one of those things, just give us an email or a phone call to the church office, and we'd love to be able to make sure that you get the prayer list for this week because we want you to be praying for the things that are there. Well, once again, thank you so much for being with us tonight, and we pray that God blesses you. We pray that you'll receive a blessing from Brother Mortensen as he brings God's word this evening. Thanks again. Have a great night. Well, hello, Faith Baptist Church for the Mortensen family, and we are so honored to be able to be a part of your Missions Emphasis Month, and uh, it really is a a joy. Uh, We were hoping to be able to be with you but excited about the the technology that allows us to be together, even from a distance. Um, We are missionaries to Honduras, serving the Lord in El Progreso, uh, along with the ministries of Iglesia Bautista El Faro, the church there, and our ministry partners with Team Honduras. Uh, To introduce ourselves, we wanted to just tell names and then something that we love about Honduras, and we'll start with my oldest here. Hi, I'm Mackenzie. I'm 13, and one of my favorite things about Honduras is... The food, but especially their baleadas. A baleada is a homemade flour tortilla with beans, eggs, and a special kind of cheese. Hi, my name is Blake. Um, uh, I'm 10, and uh, um, my favorite thing about Honduras is the people's um, uh, kindness. Hi, I'm Savannah, and I'm 5, and my fa- I love everything in Honduras, but my favorite thing in Honduras is tech. My dog, Tex. Tex is our puppy dog. (laughs) Hi, I'm Corey. We are sad not to be with y'all in person and get to meet so many of you, but we are thankful for this um, way to be able to connect with you. We will be praying for your missions month and hope that it has a great impact on your church and individual lives. Um, We do love Honduras. We are privileged to serve the Lord there. I um, felt called to the mission field from the time I was 12. And so it really is a dream come true to just be able to serve the Lord with my family um, in Honduras. Hi, my name is Grant. I'm 11, and one of my favorite things there is the iguanas. Grant is a a great iguana catcher, and uh, he is loving life in a a tropical climate with lots lots of animals and critters to catch. But we just wanted to give an introduction to our family, and thank you so much for this opportunity. We do pray that you would, or we do ask that you would pray for our family um, and pray that it would be a blessing as you focus on missions this month. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. The country of Honduras is located in Central America, south of Mexico and Guatemala. Honduras is about the size of the state of Tennessee with a population of about 9 million people. As with many Latin American countries, 97% of Hondurans claim to be Catholic. While there's a form of religion, most remain in darkness and are hungry for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ.
We are the Mortensen family. Nate, Corey, Mackenzie, Grant, Blake, and Savannah, and God has called us to Honduras to serve him. We arrived on the field in May of 2018 and joined veteran missionaries Matt and Delita Goins, also becoming a part of the multifaceted missions team of Team Honduras. Upon arriving in Honduras, our first and primary goal was learning the Spanish language. We quickly enrolled in a local language school and began tutored classes. One of the blessings of joining veteran missionaries and the local church of Iglesia Bautista El Faro is that while in language school, there were many opportunities to serve the Lord that did not require Spanish-speaking abilities. As a church and ministry, God has done great things through regular services as well as many outreach events like youth conferences, children's activities, even our living nativity. Through all of them, we strive to proclaim the salvation found in Jesus Christ. We have also seen God work in amazing ways through our ministry partnership with Medical Missions Outreach. Medical Missions Outreach allows us to host a brigade of medical providers providing free healthcare services to many who have great need. During these four-day clinics, we are able to meet thousands of medical needs and very literally show the love of Christ to hurting people. But all of this is done so that we are able to give a one-on-one -on -one gospel presentation to each person. Many have trusted Christ during these clinics, and to God be the glory, great things He has done. After completion of our first year of language school, we began to involve ourselves more in the ministries of the local church, including restarting a neighborhood Bible club. Every Saturday morning, we would meet in a local soccer field and regularly have about 25 kids attend who typically don't come to church. We pray that the seeds that have been planted will bear fruit. Unfortunately, COVID-19 restrictions have forced us to temporarily suspend this and many of the ministries of our church, but we look forward to continuing to minister to the, these needy families. Thank you for your continued prayer and faithfulness. Well, hello, Faith Baptist Church. My name is Nate Mortensen, and it really is a privilege to be able to be a part of your mission's emphasis. We were so looking forward to getting to meet you in person uh, during your mission's conference, but as the Lord has seen fit, we're still able to be a part of what God is doing in and through you all uh, as you focus on emphasizing missions this month. Um, it, it, it is incredible what technology has enabled us and is allowing us to do uh, all around the world. So, it really is a great privilege to be here. But as we focus on missions, uh, if you would, turn in your Bibles to John chapter number one. John chapter number one. Most of the time when we think about missions, we, we think about it in context of the corporate setting. Um, and that is, that is very appropriate, especially during a missions emphasis as a church. You as a church are focusing on the corporate mission uh, of reaching the world with the gospel. And, and so that is most of the time our focus, but in reality, missions is something that is done individually, but collectively at the same time. Individually, we are a part of giving and praying and going, and then we do it collectively as a body. And, and that is how God has seen fit to, to use us to be a part of his plan to reach the world with the gospel. So as we focus on missions, I want to focus our attention on more of the, the individual side, because it is true that missions is the mission of the church, but the church is Christians, it is, is a body of believers, and each one of us have an individual part in God's plan to reach the world with the gospel. So with that, that frame of work in mind, uh, I want to focus our attention on a, on a thought. 
Um, a, a preacher friend of mine has said that missions or the Christian life can be simplified to a single statement. And, and I love big idea statements. They really help me to keep things in context and, and perspective as I look at the Word of God. And so his statement was that Christianity can be summarized by knowing Christ and making him known. Knowing Christ and making him known. That is Christianity. That is missions, is knowing Jesus Christ personally and then making him known to others. You could amplify it a tiny bit by just saying, knowing Jesus Christ at the point of salvation, but then continuing to know Christ and, and grow in your knowledge of Christ as you grow in your walk with the Lord. Also, making him known to others at the point of salvation uh, by sharing the gospel and also making him known by helping them to grow in their understanding of who Jesus Christ is as our Lord and Savior. And so making Jesus Christ known and knowing him, just a, a two-sided coin that very helpfully uh, helps us look at the Bible. Um, and so as we, we look at John chapter 1, we are, are going to try and look at it through that lens. Now, even with that definition, we see something that is different compared to the religions of the world. Uh, the vast majority of the religions of the world and, and the multitudes in the world have a view of God that is very distant, very far off. Uh, the, the creator of the world, yes, maybe, uh, but a, a God that's distant, that doesn't care about his creation, not involved in his creation. Um, maybe, maybe people would describe God as, as the man upstairs, a giant killjoy that just wants to make life miserable for, for us because we have to abide by some, some kind of rules. And yet Christianity is different. While that killjoy in the sky would make a person want to do certain things or not do other things so that they will avoid something bad happening later on in their life, Christianity is about a relationship, a relationship with our creator God who also became our savior, uh, uh, the sacrifice, sacrifice for our sins, and through that sacrifice, a relationship. There's a closeness in Christianity. And even in the definition, knowing Jesus Christ and making him known, we see that. I, I, I can know my creator and my redeemer. And, and so that's the, the focus that really is so different from the religions of the world. So as we, we look at John chapter number one, I want to look at it kind of through that lens and really kind of takes a, an overview of this chapter. We are not going to dig into all of the the good meat that is here, but just an overview and then make some application for our lives. Um, John, the whole book, uh, put that in context before we go any further, the whole book of John was written towards the end of the New Testament uh, age. Uh, the first uh, three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, were written at the beginning, very close to the beginning of the time of the uh, apostles, right after Jesus' death. And they gave their testimony as to who Jesus was. And John, the Bap uh, John comes at the very end, the Apostle John comes at the very end, um, about uh, close to the turn of the century there, to one last time give his eyewitness testimony as to all that Jesus did. And the key verses for the whole book are found in John chapter number 20, verses 30 and 31. The Bible says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So that is the whole focus of John's gospel. He wants to prove who Jesus Christ was. Maybe at this point, there's people that are saying they've never met anybody that actually witnessed Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist, uh, not John the Baptist, John the Apostle is, is standing there to say, I was an eyewitness and I want to tell you what I saw now, at this time, the church was also experiencing great persecution from the Roman government. And so John is acting as an eyewitness, saying to build up the faith of the, the Christians uh, because, hey, don't, don't think that you have believed in vain. I witnessed the acts and, and the ministry of Jesus Christ. But also to the unsaved, he acts as a very strong witness pointing people to Jesus Christ. And so that's kind of the, the context of the whole book. 
um, is found in that those verses in that statement. So as we get into John chapter 1, John chapter 1 acts as like an opening statement. As John is presenting his eyewitness testimony throughout the gospel, John chapter 1 acts like an opening statement. Now, an opening statement is given by both the defense and the prosecution, and that's not a time when actual evidence is presented to the court. It is just simply a time for them to give an overview of all that you will see in the evidence that's presented. So John chapter 1, in a lot of ways, acts that way. John makes bold statements about who Jesus Christ is, and he leaves the proof for those statements until later on in, in the book. So let's begin in John chapter 1, verses, uh, we'll just begin in verse number 1 with a very bold beginning statement. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And we'll stop right there for a second. But John is saying, this is who God, who Jesus is. He was in the beginning with God. Prior to the creation of the whole world, Jesus Christ was there. But Jesus Christ was not just pre-existent to all that we see. Jesus Christ was the creator of of all that we see. Jesus Christ is called the Word here. It'll be explained further on even in this chapter, but the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, that phrase, the Word was with God, has kind of the idea in, in royal terms of two kings, two kings that would be face-to-face. -face. That word with kind of has the idea of being face-to-face, -face. and if you think of two kings, the reason that they're face to face is, face is because neither one is bowing to the other. They both are of equal authority and power because they are of equal essence. And that's what Jesus Christ was. Jesus Christ was God the Son, but he was no less God than God the Father. And they are of equal power and essence. And so as we continue reading, we realize that Jesus Christ, the Word of God, was the creator of the universe. He was pre-existent to all that we see, but not only was he pre-existent and uncreated, he was the creator. And that's who our God is. As we continue down through these verses in, in John chapter 1, we're introduced to a, a key idea that will be built upon later on in the book. In verses 12 and 13, the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Uh, here, John's uh, alluding to the, the purpose of Jesus Christ coming, and that's to bring forth new life and new birth found in Jesus Christ. We'll see that expanded as, John, uh, uh, as Jesus talks to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and then later on throughout the book, that there is new life found through the redemption found in Jesus Christ. But then verse 14 says, And the Word, talking about Jesus Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Here we understand that even though Jesus Christ, uh, and we're reminded, even though Jesus Christ physically was born, and the other Gospels allude to his birth, the, the birth of Jesus Christ did not mark his beginning. Because he was the pre-existent, all-powerful, all-creator God. And that's who Jesus Christ is. And he came to put on flesh that we might know him. And then in verse um, 18, the Bible says, or 17, the Bible says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So the eternal word of God took on flesh to come and declare who he is and who God is, God uh, as the creator of the world to us. So we, we get through those very introductory verses with some bold statements, and then we're introduced to a key character. Uh, the Bible gives us the, the account of John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was the last prophet to point people to Jesus Christ. 
And in many ways, he acts as, a, as an image or an example of all of the Old Testament prophets, pointing to Jesus Christ. And in these verses, uh, the Pharisees, religious leaders, come and they say, Who are you? Are you the Christ? Are you the promised one? Are you the, the prophet that should come? And John says, Oh, no, 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 that's not me. I am, I am not him. But don't, don't be mistaken. You're right in recognizing that I am a fulfillment of prophecy. Because in verse 23, he says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as saith the prophet Isaiah. And so John the Baptist is saying, take, take note of what I'm saying, because I am a fulfillment of prophecy. You're right in recognizing that I'm the fulfillment of prophecy. I'm not the Messiah. I'm just here to continue to point to him. Then he says that he sees Jesus, uh, when, when Jesus is baptized, he gives his testimony that he saw um, Jesus coming up out of the water and the Spirit descending and, and um, God saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I well pleased. And then John, the next day, says, hey, pointing people to Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world when he physically sees him. Then again in, in verse 35, and the next day John stood and two of his disciples, and he again points, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, consistently pointing people to Jesus Christ. And, and this isn't a, a key point here, but I think it's a good point for us to recognize. John is very quickly in these verses, in three days right next to each other, faithfully been pointing people to Jesus. Um, and yet it doesn't say that people into, uh, internalized his message very well. And it's a good reminder to us that our job is not to, to win people. Our job is to be faithful witnesses and to point people to Christ and let the Holy Spirit work in their hearts. John was a faithful witness, and that should be an example to us to just be faithful in sharing the message of Jesus Christ. But then we get into the last several verses here, and this is where I think we find the most application for our lives. In, in verses 35 through 51, we see Jesus as he's calling some of the first disciples. And so we'll begin in verse 35. Like I said, John says, uh, there's two of John's disciples there. And uh, verse 36, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples which heard him speak, they followed Jesus. Here, those disciples took, okay, wait a minute. John's pointing, he's been telling us about the Messiah to come. And here he is pointing to him, the Lamb of God. And so they begin to follow Jesus, and the Bible says Jesus recognizes that they're following him and says, what do you see? And in a way, their response is a little different because they say, where dwellest thou? And yet, they, they're not looking for an answer to the question of, are, is it true that you are the Lamb of God? Instead of wanting intellectual knowledge, they want a heart knowledge. They want to get to know Jesus. And so they ask, where are you staying? And he says, Come and see. And the Bible says that these two disciples, uh, we know one is Andrew, and the other is presumed by, by most Bible scholars as being John, the one who's writing this epistle. And, and they come spend the afternoon with Jesus, and very quickly they recognize who Jesus is. And we get to hear their testimony. Andrew goes and finds his brother and tells Peter, we have found the Messiah. And the Messiah just means the promised one, alluding to he is the one that the prophets has promised us would come, the ones that, she, that God promised he would send. We found him. And so he brings his brother Peter and, and introduces him to Jesus. And Jesus says in verse 35, thou art si or th 42, sorry, thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation of stone. And here, Andrew clearly testifies in the, the short period of time he spent with Jesus, he knows him to be the Messiah. Then the Bible tells us that Jesus went into Galilee the next day and finds Philip and invites him, follow me. The Bible doesn't tell us how much time Philip spends with Jesus, but very quickly Philip recognizes who Jesus is and he goes and finds um, uh, Nathaniel and tells Nathaniel, we have found the one whom Moses and the law speak about. And, and, and the prophets in verses 46 and, and 40, uh, 45 and 46, and Nathaniel's like, I, I don't understand. How can he be from Nazareth if he's a fulfillment of the Old Testament? And Philip says, well, come and see. Come and see. You, you, you just got to meet him. Good reminder to us. We don't have to have all of the answers in order to point people to Jesus Christ. We don't have to have 
all of the years of studying the Bible to be able to be a faithful witness to, uh, to point people to Jesus Christ. We can invite people to church. We can tell people how we got saved. And we don't have to be able to answer every single question. Now, we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God, but we can do our part to point people to Jesus as we continue to grow in knowing Jesus Christ. So then Nathaniel comes to Jesus, and Nathaniel, we get to see a little bit more of his interaction with Jesus. Jesus says, behold, in verse 47, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. And Nathaniel saith unto him, whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, behold, uh, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Wow, what a powerful statement by Nathanael. But what it is that he saw, what he saw is that Jesus Christ was demonstrating power that only God could have. Only God is omnipresent and is all places present at the same time. To know where he was at when Philip found him. Only God is omniscient to know him and who he is as a person prior to him actually meeting him face to face. And Nathaniel very powerfully testifies that is an evidence to the deity of Jesus Christ. So then Jesus very warmly responds, Because thou saw, uh, I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than these and, and that's just a wonderful place to, to pause right here. Jesus, and, and, and through these verses, we've been given the invitation to come and see, come and see, come and see. And here, Jesus is giving the specific invitation to Nathaniel. Because of your eyes of faith, you will see greater things than my omniscience and omnipresence and, and the knowledge of who I am. You'll see greater things than these. The invitation is to each one of us to know Jesus Christ and come and see. We can come and see and grow in knowing who Jesus Christ is as we continue reading through this gospel. And, and I challenge you, uh, get in God's word and spend time knowing Jesus Christ. And then, just like we've seen these disciples do, and just like the parable of the lost coin and lost sheep, once we've found him, with joy, sharing him with others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for coming to this earth uh, to die on the cross and pay the penalty for our sins. Thank you that we can know you in a personal and intimate way. I pray you'd help us to know you and then to make you known faithfully to others. In Jesus' name, amen.